The flooded rivers of Laos, 115 million years ago. These vast lowlands are a patchwork of rivers, broken up by trees and other foliage strong enough to resist the powerful water flow. Dinosaurs flourish in these tropical conditions, from small ornithischians to mighty sauropods. Like Tanganyosaurus, a 15 meter giant. In the rivers, fish, rays, turtles, and crocodiles populate the muddy water. On occasion, odd sail-like structures break the surface, followed by the tips of long crocodile-like jaws. But these belong to a different group of reptiles. By the shores of one of the many rivers, there is suddenly a mass of splashing as a school of fish flail from beneath the water, as they are attacked by an unseen predator. The water calms just as quickly, returning to its former state. But then a sail breaks the surface, cutting through the river heading towards the shore. Soon after, the tip of a snout emerges, followed by a long set of jaws, clutching a meter-long fish. The mighty reptile begins to emerge from the muddy canal, revealing a long, scaly body, powerful arms with hooked claws, and a tall, almost newt-like tail. This 9 meter predator is an ichthyovenator. At 2 tons, this male has only recently come into full maturity, carving out a territory of his own. The fish he has caught is over half the length of his skull, but as he stands on the wet sand of the riverbank, he flips his meal around in his jaws, tilts his head up, and then with little difficulty, swallows it whole. Lowering his head and then laying down on the sand with his tail still in the water, the male rests briefly, suppressing his urge to keep moving. It is not the urge to feed or any regular day-to-day -day urge that is driving him, as it is the mating season, and this male's body is pushing him to find potential mates. This pull comes around every year, even before Ichthyovenator reach full maturity. Because of that, this male has never been able to reproduce before, being ignored by females or chased off by other males. This year, he finally has a chance. He just has to find a female. The call of nature eventually forces him to get up and sink back into the river, in order to keep moving. Using his smell, he knows one female is relatively close by. Over two hours later, the young male emerges onto a wide sandbar, disturbing a group of turtles that hurry to get out of the way of the massive predator. His focus is not on them, however. It is on the female resting in the sun only 50 meters away. She knows the male is there, but she only has one eye barely open, keeping a fraction of her attention on this stranger as she basks in the sun. The male fully emerges from the river, and shakes himself, sending water flying in all directions. He then cautiously approaches her, making sure to walk in front of her, as moving in from the rear could be seen as a threat. When he is about 10 meters away from her, she opens both eyes, but barely seems to acknowledge his presence. Still apprehensive, the male knows she can see him, and instinctively begins to display for her. Standing right in front of her, showing the length of his right side, he then straightens his body out and flexes his tail, lifting it into the air. Normally, it is difficult to tell the difference between the two sexes of Ichthyovenator, but in the mating season, males develop dark colors on their sails and the edges of their tail. More importantly, their tails become dotted with black spots that run in horizontal lines, Pigment in the skin requires extra nutrients, so males that are better fed and in better health will be able to display more spots, and this is what the females are looking for. Steadily, the male rocks his tail from side to side, giving his audience of one a good demonstration. Though this has never worked before, today it seems to be working, as the female ichthyovenator examines his tail at first with curiosity that soon turns into fascination. He is doing well this time, he just has to keep it up.
Suddenly, there is a large splash to the side of the duo. Making its way out of the river is a third Ichthyovenator. This is a slightly larger, much older male, who also has been tracking down this female to mate with her. As the newcomer shakes the water off his body, the original male hisses sharply, but the older individual opens his jaws and growls loudly, a deep reverberating sound that echoes across the floodplain. The younger male shrinks back, and his aggressor almost immediately ignores him, not considering him a threat. With that, the first male takes a deep breath and lets out a challenging growl of his own, reacquiring the attention of both the female and the new male. Annoyed at the youth's sudden bravery, the challenger fully faces his opponent, and both snarl and snap their jaws at each other. It soon becomes apparent that neither is backing down, and so threats escalate to violence. The two males lift their upper bodies to stand as straight as they can, and then lunge forward. Their heads go to each other's side, and their chests slam into each other with a loud thud, sending the remaining water on their backs cascading into the air from the force of the impact. They then each wrap their arms around each other, and begin to push with all their might. Spinosaurs have denser bones than typical theropods, making them more sturdy so they do not use their jaws to attack each other like tyrannosaurs, nor do they use the claws on their hands and feet like dromaeosaurs. Instead, battles between rivals come down to sheer strength. Each male weighs just over two tons. The forces generated when they clash are colossal. They snarl as they shove each other, their long claws grazing over the other's scales as they occasionally try to bite the opponent on their back. Both their feet and their tall tails churn up the sand and water around them, and the female Ichthyovenator backs up to stay well clear of the fighting pair. The shoving match continued, but it was obvious the older male was stronger, as he kept pushing his younger counterpart back far more often. Eventually he had enough, and twisted his body before throwing the younger male into the shallow water, landing on his side with a grunt. A smaller of the two rocked back up quickly, exhaled in anger, and without hesitation, went right back in to grapple his rival, shocking the older male. In that moment, it became clear that despite being the physically weaker of the two, the first male had far better stamina, and though they didn't know it, he was better fed and in better physical shape as well. After the throw, the older male was beginning to struggle. He was taking longer and deeper breaths, and wasn't able to push back as much anymore. He had used all his strength too early. The younger male concentrated, as each time he shoved forward, he took a step forward as well. Bit by bit, he steadily pushed his opponent back, and steadily, he felt his opponent growing weaker. Right as the older male's tail began to be submerged in the river, the younger male curled up his midsection, and hurled the intruder backwards. So hard he stumbled backwards and crashed into the river, sending a shower of water in all directions, almost completely submerging him. The victor breathed deeply, trying to regain his strength. The loser, however, awkwardly righted himself, and without any resistance, slowly turned away and swam out to deeper water, submerging and then disappearing below the surface. The first male watched him leave and allowed himself to relax. That was the hardest fight of his life so far, and it definitely wouldn't be the last. For now, he was victorious, and had won in front of his potential mate, which would no doubt be an extra positive in her eyes. But as he turned to look at her, he saw that she had dived into the river to catch a fish, and was now tearing one apart in her jaws, completely oblivious to who won the fight. The male nonetheless walked up as close as he could to her, and began to present again. Sure enough, his dazzling display would be enough to get her attention, though she still wanted to finish her meal. Maybe this time, he would finally be able to prove himself. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the Spinosaur from Laos, Ichthyovenator. The first remains of Ichthyovenator were found in 2010, in the Savannah Kept province of Laos. 
Though fairly well preserved, the skeleton was mostly incomplete, and included multiple vertebra from various parts of the body, ribs, and most of the pelvis and hips. A full description would be published in 2012, but in 2014, more of the skeleton from the same individual would be excavated and researched, including more vertebra and teeth. As we can see, the first findings are in white, and the later findings are in red. It was named Ichthyovenator laucensis, the genus name meaning fish hunter, and the species name being after its country of discovery. It lived during the Aptian stage of the early Cretaceous, between 120 and 113 million years ago. So we don't have a skull or any limbs, but it is clearly a Spinosaur, and so we can use its close relatives to help get a better picture of this genus. Because of this, Ichthyovenator is estimated to have grown to between 8.5 and 10.5 metres long, and weighed between 2 and 2.4 tonnes. Now, in the family we call Spinosaurs, there are two subfamilies, Baryoconidae and Spinosaurinae. The main differences being that Baryoconidae have curved teeth with more serrations, are relatively smaller, usually live earlier, and are more adapted for terrestrial life, while Spinosaurinae have straight teeth with no serrations, are seen as more derived, are generally larger, have an external nares further back in the skull, and have traits better suited for an aquatic lifestyle. Now the subject of how aquatic this family was, especially for Spinosaurus itself, is a, let's say, very hotly debated topic. So we won't be getting too into it very much this episode. Instead, let's look at what we know about Ichthyovenator, and what hypotheses we can make on the information we have. After moving around the family a couple of times, Ichthyovenator was placed into Spinosaurinae at a basal level in 2018, as its teeth were long, conical, and had no serrations, pointing at a more piscivorous diet. Looking at the caudal vertebra of the tail, we can see the chevrons are very long, which would have made the tail tall and flat, much like a crocodile or a newt. This is a good indication that the animal had evolved for a semi-aquatic lifestyle, using its broad tail to propel itself through the water. Because of this, it's assumed that like its relatives, Ichthyovenator had a long, narrow skull and jaws, good for cutting through the water and catching slippery prey, and had reduced hind limbs, making it look stout compared to most theropods. Adapting a body plan similar to other Spinosaurinae, becoming better adapted to live semi-aquatically, even though that term is very broad. The most distinctive feature is the sail running down its back formed from expanded vertebra and would have created a sail on the animal's back in life that may have continued down the tail. But randomly over the hips, the vertebra shortened creating a sort of notch in the sail, effectively breaking it in two which as far as we know is unique in the family. So why does it do this? Well, to answer that we have to ask why Spinosaurs develop sails in the first place. Many theories have been put forward, from being fat deposits to being used in thermal regulation. While they definitely could have been used to do so, they appear to have evolved primarily as a form of display. This is usually the answer given for structures that we don't have a clear answer for, but it is a good one. Using it to signal the animal's health, warn rivals, attract mates, and one other purpose that isn't usually talked about, identifying different species of Spinosaur. Now this one isn't as supported, and the idea is also thrown around when trying to answer why Stegosaurs often have different looking backplates. But it's an interesting theory that their sails could have had the additional use of showing other closely related species that they were different just by looking at each other. This could have been useful to make sure you didn't try and mate with the wrong genus, for example. One interesting thing about Ichthyovenator's anatomy is that while the pelvis girdle was reduced, the ilium was longer than both the pubis and the ischium, being proportionally longer than any known theropod while the ischium was short in relation to the pubis, which is also strange for such a large theropod. 
Ichthyovenator is a fascinating addition to the Spinosaur family, and helps to better understand the group's theorised more aquatic lifestyle. Now of course it goes without saying that just because it was suited to catching slippery prey doesn't mean it didn't go after other sources of food. It lived in what was a large floodplain, where many species of turtles have been found, along with ray fin fish and bivalves. While on the land, there were sauropods and ornithischians. Spinosaurs in Asia are much rarer than in Africa, South America, and Europe, which has brought up the idea that the family must have been widely distributed before the major breakup of the supercontinent of Pangaea, pointing to yet undiscovered species being around during the middle to late Jurassic. We just have to find them in order to conclude this hypothesis. It's also fun to see new species come from small countries like Laos. A species that the whole country can be proud to say is unique to them. But what do you think of Ichthyovenator? And for my question of the week, do you think the idea of a sail and other display structures to identify different species holds any weight? I will say, though I do like the theory, I don't feel it is exactly, well, the strongest argument. But I digress. What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.